During 1896 and 1897, seven years before the Wright brothers would take flight, several cigar-shaped airship reports appeared in newspapers across the United States. One account appeared in the April 19, 1897 edition of the Dallas Morning News. It was written by S.E. Hayden. The account reported that an airship crashed into the property of J.S. Proctor at 6 a.m. on the 17th. The pilot was described as not of this world and had died on impact. Debris from the crash was spread across several acres when the craft collided with Mr. Proctor's windmill. Wreckage from the craft was dumped into a nearby well and the pilot was buried at the local Aurora Cemetery. T.J. Weems, a United States Signal Service officer from nearby Fort Worth, viewed the body and referred to the pilot as a margin. And Mr. Weems, who was also an astronomer, would become the first United States government official to observe an extraterrestrial and report back to the government. Papers found on the pilot were assumed to be a journal of his travels, but were written in an unknown hieroglyphic type script and could not be deciphered. It's likely these papers returned to Fort Worth with Mr. Weems and fell into the hands of government officials. The beginning of the UFO cover-up was at hand. The first official observation of an alien, the crashed remains of a craft, and all the reports of airships from the previous months would cause serious concerns in Washington. How the government would handle this information will have repercussions on the entire world till present day. Visits by little green men and flying saucers? The stuff of science fiction or drive-in theaters, maybe? Think again. In 2003, with over 400 visits by alien craft or alien creatures in British Columbia, it seems as though we're under some sort of invasion. That July, two women from Kelowna, British Columbia, had a visit of the terrifying kind. My friend Linda and I were sitting at the computer uh, late the night before she left to go back to Abbotsford. She suddenly said to me, why don't we go stargazing? And I mentioned to her that it was getting quite late. Um, it was, you know, around midnight. I was really tired. Could we possibly think about doing this the next time she was up? But she really insisted on going. The women got into Karina's car and pretty soon, found themselves on a back road, looking for a secluded area, shielded from the city lights. Karina was new to the area and wasn't sure where to find a good spot for stargazing. They soon found themselves on a road that runs between Kelowna and Vernon. There was no moon that night, so it was very dark. Karina stopped her car somewhere beside Kelowna's landfill. Karina pulled out a large spotlight she had in the car and pointed it down the road ahead of them. As Linda watched through her binoculars, she noticed a group of three stars in the shape of a triangle. She pointed them out to Karina. Neither of them could figure out what the lights could be. They both agreed on one thing. They weren't lights from a plane. There was no engine sound. The lights started to move ahead of their car changing color from white to green. The air, which had been warm, turned musty and cold. It took a second for Karina to register what they were looking at. These weren't anything from this planet, staring back at them from out of the dark. They began to move towards the two women. They ran back to the car as fast as they could, but it was like moving through quicksand. It was as if the whole world around them was slowing down to a crawl. Karina remembers having a hard time getting her hands to open the car door. Once they were inside the car, she tried to get it started. The lights inside the car flashed on and off randomly. 
It was as if the car had gone crazy. Karina finally got the car started and sped back towards town. As they drove along, Karina remarked to Linda that she felt weird, as if electricity had been zapped through her whole body, as if by a charge from a battery. Linda took comfort from the fact that they both felt the same way. That's when she looked at the dashboard clock. As they continued their drive home, Linda commented on the time. The women felt they hadn't been out of the car for more than a few minutes, but according to the clock, it had been almost an hour. Where did that missing time go? Suddenly, they both saw another large orb low in the sky on the far side of a field. Karina stopped the car. Could this be one of the same orbs they had seen earlier? Karina tried to convince Linda the orb was just a low-flying aircraft or helicopter. But even with both windows down, neither one of them could hear any noises from the mysterious orb. It started to move further away from their vehicle. To prove her point, that it was just a plane, Karina held up her spotlight out of the car window and flashed it three times directly at the orb. To her horror, it stopped dead in midair, then came flying down directly at them. Terrified, Karina panicked and took off down the road. She headed for home, trying to ignore the celestial object high above. The next morning, as Karina got out of bed, she discovered a large bruise on her left breast. She also felt nauseous and had severe head pressure. As she sat at her kitchen table drinking coffee, Linda joined her. Linda also complained about feeling sick, and suddenly, her right nostril started to bleed. Oh, oh my oh. Oh, that is oh, really. Karina grabbed a towel and tried to staunch the flow of blood. After they'd stopped the nosebleed, Linda left to take a shower and clean up. Corinna's daughter then came down to the kitchen. She too felt nauseous and complained of a stuffed up nose. Then, just like Linda, her nose began to gush blood from the right nostril. Corinna helped her stop the bleeding and not wanting to alarm her daughter, she told her nosebleeds can happen when someone feels sick. But she suspected that her encounter the previous evening hadn't ended at the front door. It began with two nights of UFO sightings in 1987. Green and white balls of light that formed into all sorts of shapes hovered directly above the zoo and caused the animals to become greatly disturbed. Due to budget cuts and because there were police in the park all night long, caretakers and other zoo employees were no longer present at the zoo all night long. The last one would leave around 11 o'clock at night and show up again around 7.30 in the morning to open up the zoo for the other employees. On the morning after the two nights of UFO sightings in 1987, the caretaker and several other employees opened the zoo and were horrified to find every animal in the zoo dead. Not just dead, but strangely mutilated. The caretaker and other employees told me that all of the animals were still locked or secured in their pens and exhibits with no sign of forced or keyed entry, so it was not like someone went and just broke in there. Although they were unable to photograph any of the animals, they said all of them looked as though they had been surgically autopsied or examined. Despite the deaths and apparent mutilation, little or no blood was present. Needless to say, the zoo was closed without explanation and no trespassing signs were placed near the entrance and on fences surrounding it. Parks Department personnel and police were summoned. The zoo was closed and within hours all of the dead animal carcasses were removed. The zoo employees that spoke to me said that the animal deaths and mutilations were eventually explained away as the work of vandals or ritualistic killers in an internal report. However, they point out that the vandals would have made all kinds of noise trying to kill the animals, had to break into most of the pens and exhibits, it would have left a significant amount of blood and other evidence behind. 
none of these things were present. No alarms went off, and the park police and other employees working in nearby areas on the night in question heard nothing. The only reason that the caretaker and employees contacted me with their stories was because they felt that the possibility existed, that the same thing could happen again, and they found the previous explanation for the deaths and mutilations to be absolutely ridiculous. Whatever happened that night, I don't know. I wasn't there. But it was something that terrified my father till the day he died. There were many times he'd be telling me the story and just get cracked up. And, and just turn while the sheep just quit and not say nothing else about it. He just wouldn't talk about it at all. This story happened in Christian County, Kentucky, on a little farm outside of Kelly, just eight miles north of the city of Hopkinsville. Hopkinsville in Christian County in the mid-1950s was uh, principally a Protestant community of blue-collar and professional workers, uh, a community not real stoutly committed to change in those days. Keep in mind also that this event occurred in the midst of August when it was hot as the hinges of Hades. And so people tended not to get terribly excited about things. When it was hot weather, they would get even hotter. There was a police officer at nearby Shady Oaks restaurant, maybe three miles from Kelly. And this police officer indicated that sometime just prior to the reported landing of the spacecraft at Kelly, that he saw uh, a series, maybe three, uh, meteors streaking north eastwardly across the sky in the general directional pattern of Kelly. It was a Sunday night, August 21st, 1955. At about 7.30 p.m., Billy Taylor went out to the outdoor privy and while out there observed a spaceship hovering 40 or 50 feet above the ground and observed it land in uh, about a 40-foot ravine or gully behind the house. Of course, concerned about it, he came on back into the house and told the members of the Sutton family whom he was visiting about this event. And uh, uh, Billy's reputation was noted for uh, being creative, to put it in a nice way. And so the family paid a little attention. About 20 minutes later, Lucky looked out the window, and what he saw would haunt him for the rest of his life. Coming up towards the house from the gully were several creatures unlike anything he had ever seen before. When members of the Sutton family first saw the creatures approaching the house, they described them as little human-like figures three to four feet tall with pointed ears. But the most prominent feature of their entire makeup was the large round eyes that appeared not to blink. A few minutes later, one of the alien creatures came right up to the window and looked in. Lucky Sutton grabbed his shotgun and fired through the window. The face disappeared. Lucky and Billy Ray, now armed as well, decided to go outside to find out what happened to the creature they'd shot. As Taylor stepped out onto the porch, a huge hand reached down from the overhang, grabbed him by the hair, and tried to pull him up. Taylor managed to get free, and both he and Lucky retreated into the house and loaded their guns with ammunition. Now the two men started firing at these little beings as if they were in the fight of their lives. But what happened when they fired was even more terrifying. When the firing started, these little creatures were knocked off their feet or would do a somersault and bounce right up and float off. Inside the house, there was absolute chaos. The women and children hid under the bed in terror, while Lucky and Billy Ray kept shooting at the advancing aliens through the walls and window screens of the house. The terrifying attack went on for hours. Each time Billy Ray or Lucky hit their mark, the creatures would react by floating away. 
as if they were surrounded by an invisible force field, and then they would crawl back towards the house. At around 11 p.m., about three hours after the battle started, there was a brief respite. Without wasting a moment, Billy Ray and Lucky loaded everyone into cars and drove to the nearest police station in Hopkinsville to get help. When the uh, investigating officers arrived, they made a thorough search of the house. Uh, they were joined soon thereafter by uh, personnel from the sheriff's office and even some military personnel from nearby Fort Campbell. Uh, a thorough search was made of the house and the grounds surrounding the house, and never did they find anything in the way of evidence. Other than bullet holes and the emotional state of the terrified family members, the investigating officers found no concrete evidence. Some reports suggest that police found a strange luminous stain in the grass where one of the creatures fell after being shot, but no one took a sample, and by morning, there was no trace. as one of America's greatest comedy talents. Born in Brooklyn, New York City, I guess you could say that he was a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks. Maybe that's why he always seemed to work harder than everyone else around him. When it came time for him to get a show on TV, he wanted to own it. Unheard of in the days of early television, Gleason often penned deals that provided him with huge sums of money and allowed him to produce many of his own shows. Everything Gleason did, he did with great passion. Every script for the TV shows had to be just the way he envisioned it. No one was ever allowed to step out of character. Camera shots and angles were always set up the way he wanted them. His passion also extended into his personal life. Fascinated by flying saucers and the unexplained, he ultimately assembled one of the world's greatest parapsychological libraries. The bulk of it resides today at the University of Miami Library. In 1982, I was a guest on a talk show at a Miami radio station. The subject was UFOs and the paranormal. After the show, I was handed a note by the receptionist. This often happens when I do radio guest spots because some people prefer their, to share their own UFO or paranormal experiences with me off the air. While walking to my car, I took a quick look at the note. It said, please call Mr. Gleason at, and it gave a phone number. When I arrived back at my hotel room, I called the number, asked for Mr. Gleason, and gave my name. An assistant got on the phone and informed me that Jackie Gleason wanted to speak to me, if possible, the next day at a Fort Lauderdale location. Well, needless to say, I accepted the invitation. The meeting location was a bar at the Jolly Roger Hotel in Fort Lauderdale. Now, I don't know if Gleason owned the lobby, owned the hotel, or merely had friends there, but after stopping by the front desk, I was escorted to a small bar that was closed to the public at that time of day. Gleason sat at a table like a king holding court, but looked older and weaker than I had imagined he would. I wondered why Gleason hadn't met me in one of his favorite Miami haunts, but it may be that he just wanted to keep a low profile. Either way, I knew that Gleason was a serious guy who hated small talk, and I wasn't about to ruffle his feathers. After a brief handshake, Gleason asked me a number of questions about my UFO and paranormal investigations. We talked for about an hour and a half, actually. He asked questions, and I answered them. He said to me, you know, I get your newsletter, he said knowingly. Good stuff. He was especially interested in articles that covered the topic of crashed UFOs. At that time, a lot of buzz had been created by former military officers who had begun to speak out about their involvement with the cover-up of UFO crashes. Out of the blue, Gleason told me how that Richard Nixon was a good friend of his. In fact, he had supported Nixon in every possible way during his successful bid for the presidency in 1968. In 1971, Gleason's efforts were rewarded 
when he attended a small White House dinner in Gleason's honor. After dinner, Gleason spoke privately with Richard Nixon. He asked the president if there was anything that Nixon could tell him about UFOs. Were they real? Were they alien spacecraft? Well, according to Gleason, Nixon told him, Well, Jackie, if you could arrange to arrive at McGill Air Force Base in Tampa sometime over the next few days, I'll arrange to have you shown some things that may help answer some of your questions. Gleason arrived in Tampa, Florida a day and a half later. After calling a phone number provided to him by someone on Nixon's staff, he headed out to McGill Air Force Base. After arriving on the base, he was taken to a dark-colored building that appeared to be some sort of a storage facility. Once inside, he had to pass through several levels of security. Finally, Gleason was escorted into a large room where some strange debris lay on the floor. An officer told him, This material is from Roswell. No emotion, just a matter-of-fact statement. The officer handed Gleason a small piece which seemed almost weightless and very flexible. Just then, a light came on in the center part of the room. Gleason was astonished to see what looked like a large piece of a broken disc just floating a few feet above the floor. Warned not to approach it, Gleason still got an eye for it, but the surprises weren't over. After just a few minutes, Gleason was escorted to another room. Three containers with glass plates for viewing greeted him. These were the occupants found near the object you just saw. Again, with little emotion, the officer gave Jackie a one-sentence description that spoke volumes. The beings were about four to five feet tall. Two of the bodies were badly damaged, but one was in very good shape. As Gleason looked at it, the officer said, This one died later. It had large oval eyes and grayish skin and looked male. Are they all males? Gleason asked. Your guess is as good as ours. He answered Jackie with a slight smile, but it was time to go. The experience of seeing the object and bodies affected Gleason more than he first realized. Los Angeles air raid occurred on February 24, 1942, when a UFO strayed too close to the coastline. It was less than three months after the United States entered World War II as a result of the Japanese Imperial Navy's attack on Pearl Harbor, and one day after the bombardment of Elwood on the 23rd. Something flew over the coastline, causing the military to go on alert. Air raid sirens sounded throughout Los Angeles County on that night. A total blackout was ordered, and thousands of air raid wardens were summoned to their positions. At 3.16 a.m., the 37th Coast Artillery Brigade began firing 12.8-pound anti-aircraft shells into the air at the reported target over 1,400 shells would eventually be fired. Pilots of the 4th Interceptor Command were alerted but never ordered to fly. The artillery fire continued sporadically until 4.14 a.m. To this day, no one knows for sure what they were shooting at. Images taken on that night clearly show a saucer-shaped object hovering within the intense beams of the military spotlights. My whole family we're going to bed 11 o'clock and uh, I looked out the window of my bedroom and I saw this uh, green shimmering light in the sky and a billowing clouds, a small point in the sky, maybe uh, 500 tops a thousand feet in the air. 
So it was well within our atmosphere. And uh, the smoke was billowing out and green, green shimmering lights behind it. I called to my mother, uh, the sky is green. And she comes in and she looks, sure enough, the sky was green. And uh, pretty soon uh, my whole family, my parents, my sister and myself were out on the front lawn. Uh, so it was summer because we were still in our pajamas and uh, house coat. Father didn't know what it was. My mother, my mother said, it's the second coming. Very re religious woman. And uh, she thought it was the second coming because she, none of us had any clue as to what it was. But it was a huge craft, perfectly silent, huge round uh, lights of various colors, none of which were FAA standard, and uh, <clears throat> just sat there. And then I looked out, we looked off to the, to the left, and here's the, a little funnel cloud of smoke coming down. And uh, it was later, you know, my, my sister just didn't pay any, any more attention after that. And under hypnosis, it was revealed that this little tornado of uh, smoke that came down had a craft, a smaller craft in it. And small gray beings came out of that craft, took me, and then took her. She remembers them taking me and then taking her to be examined. See, they don't, she doesn't know what happened with me, but she knows what happened with her and then returned us. And when we, we don't know if our parents were taken or not because when she was returned, I was back on the lawn and so were my parents. My, we were all just looking up like we we're frozen in time, okay? And then I can only assume this is the missing time phenomenon, <laughs> okay? So, so when we were all back in place, we were switched back on, so to speak, and the craft had departed. All that was left was that smoke. Uh, <clears throat> we're watching as the sky seemed to be giving birth to this huge craft. Uh, the lights were, were, were there and it just kind of came through a vortex. And that's, that's why I believe that the extraterrestrials come from other planets and or other dimensions uh, through a vortex. They, uh, instead of going from point A to point B, they fold time and leave their space time and arrive at ours instantaneously. In 1939, Cordell Hull Secretary of State for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided to show his cousin a little surprise. Holt brought his cousin, the Reverend Turner Hamilton Holt, into a sub-basement of the U.S. Capitol building to show him something that would shake him to his soul. Hull consequently made his cousin swear to never reveal what he was about to see. Hull took Holt into a room in that basement that contained four large glass containers into which a child could easily fit. In each of the containers was a creature of horrendous visage. The tiny humanoid-like creatures were floating in some sort of chemical preservative. According to the Reverend Holt, Cordell Hull told him that this had to be kept secret to prevent widespread panic among the American public. Holt asked his family to wait until both he and cousin Cordell were both dead before revealing this information. And Holt's children did just that. At 7 a.m. on the 30th of June in 1908, near the lower Tunguska River in Siberia, a large explosion occurred. The explosion was so massive that it caused damage 400 miles away and was heard even further. For several nights all over northern Europe, the sky glowed enough to light the streets of London. At first, it was assumed that a massive meteorite had collided with the Earth. However, after the Second World War and the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, photos of the cities 
were compared with aerial photos of the Tunguska blast, and they were stunningly similar. As a result of this, various scientists speculated that a nuclear explosion had taken place over the area, and because no nation possessed a nuclear device at that time, the logical conclusion was that it was from an exploded alien nuclear-powered craft. My name is Edward Albert Meyer, but all around the world I am simply called Billy. I received the name in Tehran when I was on the road, and since then this name has remained with me. Billy Meyer is a uh, soon-to-be 70-year-old man living in Switzerland. Meyer has one arm. He lost his arm in about 1965. He started to take photographs of UFOs in 1964. He claims that his first contacts with extraterrestrials took place when he was only a five-year-old boy. That there is more photographic evidence and, and, and video evidence for this particular case than any other existing case. And it's, it's, it's almost so good that you're just like, holy cow. Using the very same film the skeptic refers to, we can see that the UFO does indeed partially go behind the hill. Since the hill is some distance from the camera, perhaps a quarter mile, it's impossible that the UFO is a small model. I personally showed Meyer's UFO photos and films to the owners of the company that won the Academy Award for Special Effects. When I asked them if these were models, these photos and films, they said, no, we know models and those aren't models. I asked, can you duplicate Meyer's films? And they said, if we could, we'd have to go to CGI. And I reminded them that in 1976 and 78, there was no Photoshop, no CGI, no home computers. I once made recordings of the whirring sounds of Semyaze's beam ship. In the original preliminary investigation report done on this case, eight different sound engineers had the opportunities to analyze the sounds on oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers. These included three different laboratories, including U.S. Naval Undersea Labs. They could find no sound source of record that could produce these sounds. In 1958, Meyer sent to the 25 European countries his about 115, 120 specific predictions. The United States of America will be engaged in two wars with Iraq. The second war will be conducted under a president who is the son of a former president. The second war will lead to an unbelievable disaster. Perhaps the most startling of what I call the prophetically accurate information in the Meyer case pertains to Meyer's astronomical information about numerous planets, but especially Jupiter, its rings, its moons. Meyer specifically said that Io was the most volcanically active body in the solar system. He published that five months before we discovered it. More than a year after he published the information on a ring of Jupiter being composed of ionized sulfur particles, Science Magazine published that information in January of 1980. The skeptics would like us to believe that this man, with no resources, working as a night watchman and on a partial disability pension, with one hand, he is not only a master model maker, filmmaker, photographer, digital and special effects person, videographer, metallurgist, electronics genius, sound recording engineer, knowledgeable about topography and map making, geography, ancient history, uh, mining, ores, agriculture, and 30 other disciplines that he's brought to bear in, in terms of the information of the, this case. They will credit him with that, but they won't say, hey, the guy's telling the truth. He's the one that's meeting with these people. Then in 1947, the United States government
would become mired in secrecy when an alien spacecraft crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell incident seemed just to involve debris from a craft of some sort, as no main part of the craft could be found on the Brazel Ranch. This led to speculation that the main part of the craft had managed to travel on before coming to rest. Later, the second section of the saucer was found. It came down in an area west of Chiraco, New Mexico, known as the Plains of San Agustin, where witnesses discovered a strange metallic object and several dead bodies. The bodies and wreckage were sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for study. Many speculate it remains there to this day. One of the things that really shocked the Allied forces during World War II was the technology possessed by the Germans. The V-2 rocket, basically a 1940s version of most any modern intercontinental ballistic missile, was at least 30 years ahead of what every other government had available. German aircraft were the first to use swept-wing technology, despite the fact that we're told such aircraft cannot fly in a stable manner without computers which did not exist in a form that could be placed aboard aircraft in the 1940s. According to the U.S. Army's official history of World War II, some German planes even used television and radar-guarded weapons. The Germans were the first to fly jets and the only ones to use them during World War II. Some were made of exotic composite materials, carefully held in place by special radar-absorbing glue. America's V-2 stealth bomber bears a striking resemblance to some of the German jets of World War II and is assembled in much the same way. But those jets were assembled and flown in the 1940s. The question is, how did Germany, which had been forced to disarm after World War I, develop so much technology in such a short period of time? The answer is, they may have had help. German plans for saucer-shaped craft found and examined after World War II by the Allied Intelligence Services suggest that the Germans may have had access to one or more crashed UFOs which had gone down somewhere in Germany at a much earlier date. The circular craft, which Germany never had time to actually produce that we know of, would have been powered by a sophisticated gravity drive using powerful magnetic fields. Was Germany able to glean enough technology from crashed UFOs to jump ahead of the rest of the world in electronics, engineering, and weaponry? Considering the fact that the United States spent the next 30 years after World War II ended relearning and copying what Germany already knew in terms of technology, the answer might just be yes. If the United States government somehow was inexplicably unaware of the existence of extraterrestrial life up to the 1950s, then on July 29, 1952, they would be forced to concede the issue when a squadron of UFOs overflew the capital. The Washington National Airport sightings were not just a single night of UFO flyovers. From July 12th to July 29th, the capital was buzzing with UFO activity on a nightly basis. On July 19th at 11.40 p.m., air traffic controller Edward Nugent spotted several craft 15 miles southwest of the capital. There were no scheduled aircraft in the area 
and these craft were not flying any established flight paths. He wrote in his report that their movements were completely radical compared to those of ordinary aircraft. Other controllers in the area confirmed the radar blips and observed the orange ball-type UFOs outside their windows. The story made front-page headlines and alarmed the Truman administration. The president himself personally called Captain Edward J. Rupert, the supervisor of the Air Force's Project Blue Book investigation into the UFO mystery, and asked for an explanation of the sightings. The president was told it was a temperature inversion. However, the Air Force placed several jet pilots on nationwide alert with orders to shoot down any UFO that ignores orders to land. To this day, there is no explanation for this incident. The government accepted the weather-related explanation because it was easy to tell this to the public rather than admit they knew the craft were alien in origin. CBS was making a special documentary about the UFO phenomenon in 1973. Veteran news anchor Walter Cronkite was approached with the idea. Though the program was to be hosted by several CBS news reporters, Cronkite would do the interviews. By 1973, I had already been investigating UFOs for several years. As it happened, Walter Cronkite read a small piece that I wrote for a now-defunct UFO publication about the Air Force cover-up of UFO information. Cronkite was making a list of people he wanted to interview for the CBS special, and the article interested him. In September of 1973, I received a letter from CBS News indicating their interest in my work. After a few phone calls, I was actually able to meet and speak with the man himself. On a cool New York City day in late September, I sat down and had an informal lunch with Walter Cronkite. As we lunched, Cronkite told me about the TBS special and indicated that he might want to interview me. He wanted a younger person's perspective on the phenomenon. Most of the UFO researchers in those days were older and had taken up the topic as a retirement project. Cronkite was especially interested in some of the Air Force stories I'd collected about the cover-up. After about 30 minutes of back-and-forth conversation, Cronkite said to me, Let me tell you my UFO story. For the next five minutes, I sat in stunned silence as he told me what had happened. In the 1950s, Cronkite was part of a pool of news reporters brought out to a small South Pacific island to watch the test of a new Air Force missile. The reporters had been warned that photography and audio recordings were forbidden. They would have to give a written account of the event. As Air Force security personnel walked around the perimeter of the test area with guard dogs and the news reporters watched, the missile fired up and was about to be released. Just then, a large disc-type UFO appeared on the scene. Cronkite guessed that the object was about 50 to 60 feet in diameter, a dull gray color, and had no visible means of propulsion. Because the noise of activity around him and the missile engine was so loud, he couldn't tell whether the disc made any noise. He didn't notice any coming directly from the object. As Air Force guards ran toward the UFO with their dogs, the disc covered about 30 feet off of the ground. It suddenly sent out a blue beam of light which struck the missile. It also struck a guard and the dog at the same time. The missile was frozen in midair about 70 feet from the launcher as it had taken off, and the guard was frozen in mid-step and a dog frozen in midair as he jumped at the disc. Cronkite reminded me that all this happened within a very short space of time, probably about five minutes or less. Suddenly, the missile exploded. After that, 
the disc vanished. The guard and dog looked all right, but were quickly taken away by medical personnel. At the same time, guards rapidly ushered the reporters into a concrete observation bunker. After about 30 minutes of sitting in that hot box, they were brought out into the air again and addressed by an Air Force colonel. The officer told them it was all part of the test. Obviously making it up as he went along, the colonel said the event was staged to test media reaction to UFOs. He reinforced the usual line to the reporters that flying saucers were probably not extraterrestrial, but what people were actually seeing was secret planes being tested by the Air Force. This test was designed to show the media how shocking it could be to suddenly view a new technology. Well, Cronkite was certain that what he viewed was indeed a new technology, but he was also sure it was not an earthly one. He didn't believe the Air Force explanation then, and he didn't believe it at the time that he told me the story. Astronaut Gordon Cooper was assigned to a jet fighter group in Germany. While stationed there, he remembers very vividly the weak and entire formation of circular objects passed over the airbase on an almost daily routine. But that's not all. While a project manager at Edwards Air Force Base, just three years before entering America's space program, Cooper had assigned a team of photographers to an area of the vast dry lake beds near Edwards. The former astronaut disclosed that while the crew was deployed, they spotted a strange looking craft above the lake bed and they began filming it. Cooper says the object was very definitely hovering above the ground and then it slowly came down and sat on the lake bed for a few minutes. During this time, the motion picture cameras were filming. There were varied estimates by the cameraman on what the actual size of the object was, but they all agreed that it was at least the size of a vehicle that would carry normal-sized people in it. Colonel Cooper was not fortunate enough to be outside at the time of this incredible encounter. But he did see the films as soon as they were rushed through the development process. It was a typical circular shaped UFO, he recalls. Not too many people saw it because it took off at quite a sharp angle and just climbed straight on out of sight. Where are these films today? Why would Gordon Cooper, a respected and honorable American hero, make up such a story? According to him, UFOs were seen regularly at Edwards Air Force Base. the most damning evidence that the United States was actively participating in a government cover-up comes from Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso. Corso was the chief of the Pentagon's Foreign Technology Desk in Army Research and Development working under Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau. And he was on the staff of President Eisenhower's National Security Council for four years between 1953 and 1957. In his book, The Day After Roswell, Corso claims that technology gleaned from the Roswell crash helped kickstart technological advancements in accelerated particle beam devices, fiber optics, lasers, integrated circuit chips, and Kevlar material. Corso's duties at the Pentagon required him to oversee the storage of physical evidence and files on the Roswell crash and to leak this material to corporations 
for the advancement of our technology. Corso also claimed the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars, was meant to achieve the destructive capacity of electronic guidance systems in incoming enemy warheads, as well as disabling enemy spacecraft, including those of extraterrestrial origin. Some of the most compelling evidence that UFOs are here and hailed from somewhere else comes from encounters involving the military itself. One such encounter involves the USS FDR. Crewman Chester Group Grzynski describes what happened. In the year 1958, we were on a shakedown cruise when there was a small light that was following our ship. Then the light came right up to us came in close enough to us so that you could see the shape of the object and also see that there were figures inside of it. The impression that I got was that those figures were not human beings. I was down below when I was told to go up topside to see something strange. So I went up and couldn't believe my eyes. I saw a bright white ball of light. It headed straight for us, getting bigger and bigger. It was spherical about 75 to 100 feet long. It turned red-orange, and I could feel the heat on my face. I could see silhouettes of figures looking at us. They had no features, and you could tell they weren't human. Then the bottom turned cherry red, and it vanished in a flash. Soon after the incident, crew members who talked about it were transferred. Then the CIA came on board to investigate a so-called gambling problem. It was a massive cover-up, Coach Krasinski. There was no gambling. Something unexplained is going on in the skies over the Hudson River Valley in New York State. Strange happenings torment those who drive its dark highways. Bizarre time-lapse experiences, which are relived as nightmares. It's a place where contact with other worlds is as close as a trek in the nearby woods. I was driving home at night, and my car just stalled. It's never done that before. So I popped the hood, and I got out, and I looked up, and I saw this formation of lights. And I kept looking. It was actually this gigantic vessel. I couldn't hear it. I didn't know what it was. It was very odd. When I got home that night, I saw on the news that 3,000 people in the Hudson Valley had seen the same thing. Now, when 3,000 people saw the same thing I did, it's more than just a coincidence. As early as 1948, the government already knew the UFO secret. In that year, the United States Air Force produced its top secret and highly controversial estimate of the situation, an official report concluding flying saucers to be interplanetary in origin. General Nathan Twining, head of the Air Materiel Command, stated that flying saucers were real and not visionary or fictitious, that they had metallic or light reflecting surfaces, were circular or elliptical in shape, flat on the bottom and domed on top, and were sometimes sighted in well-kept formation flights varying from three to nine objects. Top secret Canadian government document dating from 1950, written by Wilbert Smith, the head of the Canadian government's UFO research project entitled Magnet, quotes Mr. Smith saying, 
The matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher than the H-bomb. By 1969, after multiple secret studies had concluded that flying saucers were very real, the United States government closed its public study on UFOs. Project Blue Book ended with assurance from the government that the UFOs represented no threat to national security.